about that. Yeah. Should we be panicking here in Seattle? Because I think some people are panicking. Well, not so much from the last game. Um, I, I just – they didn't – we talked about it going into the game. You know, they didn't match up great with them uh, at the line of scrimmage. So there's still a lot of positives to take away from it. I, I Watching it on TV – I thought, oh, gosh, Gino didn't play good. And then when I went and watched the tape, I came away feeling better about Gino, at least. Um, I mean, he was under siege from uh, from Bosa and company up front. What, like 17 pressures? What? Oh, that, what? man. What? That was brutal. Was that the number? Was it 17? It was, I believe, 17 pressures. Oh, man. Yes. Yeah, it was every snap. And then you get the uh, – and I didn't – I didn't uh, – see all of the game on TV. I saw a good chunk of it. I, what did they say on the interception that was thrown to DK? Because DK just mm. drifted like crazy. He just kind of yeah. hung Gino out to dry on that one. I don't yeah. know what they, if they pointed yeah. that out or not, but that was very evident. Yeah, I didn't really point that out. But they didn't. Many, many have afterwards, DJ. Yeah. That was not great. No. I don't. What did you think about DK grabbing the headsets and you know cussing out Grub and? Oh, know. I didn't even know that took place. That's oh, not a great look. Oh, that was not. Yeah, that was not a great look. So why don't you ask him, Salk? Why don't you ask him your poll question? I did put up a little poll this morning, DJ. Yep. If, you, if you could trade DK right now for a first and third round pick, would you do it? That's the AJ Brown trade. Question. That's the AJ Brown yeah. deal, right? So that that's, that's my that's- basis for it. I don't know if that's fair or not. Maybe you couldn't get quite that much. Maybe I don't know the exact you know value, but I'm just taking AJ Brown as a rough equivalent. He's, first number is a two, right? Not Amari Cooper, right. not Devontae, whose first number is a three. But he's not worth as as much as Amari Co- as uh, as Devontae was the last time he was traded, right? Which was I think two firsts. So first and a third. Would you do it? I'd be tempted. That's a, that's a big haul um, at this point in time. Plus. You know, it's from a contract standpoint, um, reset some things there. Look, if DK was a culture setter, a team leader, all those things, which I don't know from the outside, um, when you have the ability that he has, if he checked every single one of those other boxes, it'd probably be hard for me to, to move him. But um, just based off one story to one story alone that you guys are telling me, that, that would um, seem to not be the case. Uh, so, yeah, one and a three is a high price for a receiver when they're plentiful in the draft each and every year. Are the Chargers missing Keenan Allen and Mike Williams? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, that's a, I mean, that was their passing offense. I, I feel like the Chargers, I was uh, telling this to Harbaugh before uh, when we talked to him the night before the game. I said, I feel like when people talk about the word timing a lot, they kind of forget the root word. Um, you know, I, I do think they need some more time in this with the new coordinator, uh, with all new pieces around Herbert and trying to figure out how to um, maximize their opportunities in the pass game because they are running the ball. That's a thing that's, uh, you know, that's missing is when you run the ball as well as they are, or as committed as they are to running the ball, they should be able to pay that off more uh, in the passing game. And I think that's, you know, they're still trying to feel that out. But, yeah, they don't have – they don't have the reliable, trusty uh, weapons that that Herbert had had. So I, that'll be a that'll be a big to do in the off season uh, is uh, is upgrading that receiver core. But Lab McConkey's done some nice things. I think he's going to be a good player. Um, you know, Josh Palmer's been you know continues to kind of be injured and a little bit up and down. But yeah, I mean, you look at the roster; they don't have a number one, and you could argue that maybe they don't have a you know a legit big time number two. Yeah, the question is, how important are those things, right? I mean, I think that's kind of why Brock asked yes. the question. Like, mm-hmm. are you missing them? Like, yeah, of course you'd be better if you had those guys on your team. They're good players. Yeah, I but if you're resetting your team right. and you want to be a physical team, and Mike McDonald yeah. said that to us on Friday. What's like the value of, of Keenan, who I love, by the way. I love Keenan. Allen. Yeah. one of my favorite players in the league. But is it really as valuable at, for a team that wants to as the Harbaugh's want to do be more physical. And, and and that's part my argument on DK has a lot less to do with, you know, who he is as a player and just the positionality of it. If you say you want to be a physical team. football team and your offensive line stinks to holy hell, why would you continue to pay more money for a wide receiver who can't help you with that that's when he might oxymoron. bring back something what? Holy hell. Sorry. That's a strong oxymoron. Do you like stinks to high heaven better? Is that yeah. one better? All right. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. Know. It's a heaven and hell situation. I should know who I'm talking to with you and DJ. I should know that you guys will call me on that stuff. Um, why, why would you want to pay a wide receiver if that's your goal? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair point. Um, look, you 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 build the house with the foundation first, and that's the line of scrimmage, and that's where they've got to get better. So if you can take resources to do that and, and from the outside and, and dump those resources on the inside, I get that. That's the identity that you're that you're searching for. Um, yeah, I, that's hard. To, it's hard for me to argue against that logic if uh, if that's the direction they really want to take the team. OK, is, so last I, question on this is yeah. a first and third unreasonable. That seems very high. OK, what's a, what is reasonable then? I think what has become in vogue is these. Uh, uh, picks like to me, DK would would feel almost like it would be a a three and a three that can become a two. So you'd get oh, those two wow, picks, which in a best case scenario would give you a two and a three. If you came out of that with a two and a three, I would think that's probably what you're in. Mm. And in some ways, if you look at uh, you know what Green Bay did, look at instead of looking all the the that teams uh, gave up to get these star receivers, look at what most of these teams have done to replenish. Uh, after that guy left, Green Bay being the poster child. Houston, probably another one, right? The Texans to yep. some degree in, in, in that manner of building with young wide receivers. So along those lines, and I know it's very early. What month are we sitting in right now? October. And the draft is many months away. But you've got a little bit of a feel for the offensive line in the line of scrimmage. If you yeah. were to trade and make a move like this and get a second and a third or who knows, maybe just a first. Is this a is this a draft that right now looks like it could be one that has difference makers at the foundational line of scrimmage spots? I think it's from everything and everybody I've talked to that's been out and seen all the top guys. Um, the the word depth with offensive line probably is used more than high, high end guys. Mm -hmm. um, but um, look, there's. There's where kind of the Seahawks are at some of these positions where, you know, it's like, uh, man, I would love to get a C. You know, I'll, I'll take a C on a test. I mean, I would love, I mean, A's are great, but I can pass and I can literally, uh, no pun intended, I can pass my classes here if I can just go from some of these D's and F's to C's and B minuses. Brock always likes to say C's get degrees, right? Is that what I said? That was, that was, that was, is that what I that was my line. I used to say that in college and then I was always hear the retort, which was, which was when in doubt, look about. <laughs> I was like, well, there's the other way to look at it. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, that's funny. Well, I mean, th that is also part of it for me. And, and you know, I don't know why it's so freaking hard to find a good offensive lineman, but just the scarcity at that position compared to the relative you know, depth at wide receiver around the league and in college and just the pipeline for it, I'm sure it's just a lot easier to find athletic guys who can run fast and jump and catch than it is to find gigantic humans who are also athletes. Yeah, seven on seven tends to be a more fun offseason activity than a lineman camp. Uh, so, you know, that's just it is what right. it is. That's what these kids are doing. They're running, running, running routes, catching balls year round. Um, and it's been that way for several years now to the point where every time I go and talk to a high school team or if I'm you know, talking to kids that are training, and, and I talk to him individually, what positions do you play? Oh, I play wide receiver and corner, and I go, dump the wide receiver, go play corner. Every year at the draft, we have a cutoff on the board at wide receiver and say, like, I can't. At some point in time, there's so many of these guys, I've got to just start listing some of these guys as free agents. And then you get over to the corner pile, and after about 8 to 10, you're like, oh, crap. Like, i got to find some corners. There's got to be some more corners around here somewhere. Hmm. So if you're a kid that's listening and you've got an opportunity between offense and defense, corner and receiver, go play corner. Occasionally, we get really good questions from our audience, and uh, I got a text here, uh, text here just a minute ago. Hashtag Ask DJ. For you, DJ, that says, if, ask DJ. if the trade market has changed for wide receivers that significantly, will there be a reset on contracts for wide receivers at some point as well? That's a good question. Um, I, I, my, my stance on the receivers is I still think you'll see some big numbers on the second contracts which if you get these kids coming into the league as juniors and they're 20, 21 year old guys, you're still going to see these guys at 26, you know, getting good deals. I think what the ship that sailed is that the guys that, you know, hit the market at 30, even 29, 30, um, teams are just going to say, well, we'll, you know, we'll move on. We'll go ahead and uh, we'll go get the next one. You know, we'll wait for the next batch of guys.
It's kind of interesting because DK is along those lines, but he started so stinking young, mm -hmm. right? He started yeah. 21. He got his first deal, his first money, and now, well, the market is kind of ramped up again. He's got one more year, I believe, on his deal after this season, but you know he wants some of that new money that these that his peers yeah. have gotten. So kind of complicates That's the one it. where it's going to be challenging. I mean, that that's that's kind of like the poster child, you know. I, I saw it. We just talked about the Charger guys. I saw it, you know, with, with Mike Williams and Keenan Allen. Yeah. Kind of use those guys up until they're about 30, and then you have to be willing to, to move on and find the next crop. But I kind of started to look at, like, the Raiders O-line, Jags O-line, <laughs> Browns. Actually, great. the Browns. There's a reason why those teams aren't very good. Yeah, and trying to figure out, okay, so if we got some Ds and Fs, are there some Bs, some Cs in a trade market? Is there any avenue for that for the Seahawks for the next couple weeks? Yeah, I think you can explore it. It's just, man, it's – it's just hard to find linemen. And I, I mean, I think that goes, I think this kind of marries up with the point of, you know, would you be willing to move a receiver? And it's like, well, if you've got to get all these resources to go find offensive linemen, they're harder to find. Um, but trying to, you know, trying to pluck offensive linemen off bad teams is difficult because usually that's the main reason why they're bad. What do you make of the way the Seahawks have built their offensive line? I mean, you, you got Charles Cross, who was a first round pick. Yeah. You've, Stud. you've got uh, a left guard in uh, Lake and Tomlinson that they got near the end of free agency this year. Same with Connor Williams at center. You got Bradford, a fourth rounder, second uh, year guy at right guard. And then, unfortunately, Abe Lucas hurt. You tried George yeah. Fant. He got hurt. And now you're on to Stone Forsyth, a, a seventh round pick. Where does that, how does that, you know, kind of measure up to the way other teams around the league have gone about, have gone about trying to build that unit? I think it's pretty traditional. I mean, you've got the two tackles who were high picks, um, you know, came in together and, and have some talent. So you devoted some resources there. And then teams will usually try and fill in with the interior with a mixture of, you know, veterans as, as well as mid-round picks. I mean, that's kind of the – that's pretty standard generic formula for how you address and build the offensive line. I've always felt – and this is, uh, you know, one of the things the Ravens did for a long time and have continued to do is – regardless of where you are uh, depth-wise or talent-wise, you know, one of their first three picks every year is going to be an offensive lineman. Um, it, it just is. They're going to try and bring in, you know, high-end, high-end players along that offensive line every year. And if that means that one guy has to redshirt for a year, uh, has to be a swing player, if that means Jonathan Ogden's got to play guard as a rookie, uh, you do it. Um, there, there was <laughs> also a, a thing where we never got to the point where, um, okay, we've already addressed this need in the draft. Let's go on to the next thing. It was literally we would stay best available player, and that's how you end up getting Marshall Yonda a couple rounds after you took Ben Grubbs in the first round. Um, so it's it's very intentional, and it's just you cannot have enough. You just can't have enough depth there. So that's that's kind of the philosophy that I that I believe in, and hopefully you hit on some some mid round, late round guys when you can. But I just think you have to just keep going back to that well each and every year. And they did so with Jane Salk's favorite player this year, Salk. I mean, Roger Rosengarten, mm -hmm. second rounder out of the University of Washington. Yep. And my mom, kinda, big fan of uh, big, Roger Rosengarten. Yeah. Nice, came on, nice. He came on the show and just dominated, let's be clear. Like, yeah. spoke <laughs> spoke so well at 7.30, no less. I know, it was very I mean, impressive. We, yeah, we took a flyer and took a risk. You sure did, for your yeah, whole baby. college. Never talked to I, a college kid before noon. Never talked to a college kid before noon. There's no upside <laughs> on the radio and ever doing that. DJ, you mentioned the corners and the scarcity of that in the draft. What has happened to linebackers? I mean, well, we're, we're, it's, it's, you know, I mean, is it the same? Is it the same conversation? I don't think it's ever been harder to play that position than it is right now. If you look at, like, think about Brock. Like, go back to when you know when you were in high school and uh, Chuck Bowers, fullback at, linebacker, number forty-four, yeah, neck roll for days. Hell yeah, I remember. There you that. go. But don't you remember just like, hey, you ha you key the guard. Like it was like high hat, low hat. You've got you just get a, you're gonna fill off of the puller. Like it was so simple, Simon, with what you saw and what your keys were and what you do. And now you look at it, and we've got false pullers, we've got orbit motion, we've got jets. Like their mind, there's so much eye candy for these linebackers. That's just mentally what's messing with you. And now I'm being faced with okay, now I got to fill uh, inside and, and you know be able to get a bigger back on the ground while I'm worried about being able to stretch outside. And now oh by the way, we've got RPOs, so I'm getting pulled up into the line of scrimmage and they're whizzing the ball right by my ear on a slant. Like 
I, I just think it's never been harder to play that position, so, and that's why uh, that's why I think you know you look at when you get some of those premier guys. It's why the Ravens. I go. I don't want to keep going back to the Ravens. It's why they traded for Roquan Smith. Those guys are hard to find. Like if you get a big time guy, you you can go get him. That's that's a huge huge impact on a defense in today's game. Well, it's funny though because linebacker value has gone down right in, in terms of what they're getting paid, and this is the thing that I used to fight about with John Clayton all the time. I mean, he used to come on our show every oh, day. Daniel, it was so painful. I had to Stop listen it. to this crap in every commercial Stop break. It. I'd have to Stop look at Salt, it. and he'd be like, "This just drives me crazy." <laughs> Would you Stop. That is not the case. That's uh, not of, true. I mean, it's of. a little the case, but not entirely the case. Yes. Okay. What's just, the argument? The NFL just like slaps value on positions. And then everyone just goes along with it. Yep, that's what it is. And John would just tell me, he's like, well, you got to pay, you can't pay him that. He's, he's not worth it. He's a, he's a corner. He, he can only pay him this. Uh, this guy's a safety, so why is he only going to get that much? Uh, of course, a linebacker in the market is uh, 15 million, so he's only going to get 15 million. This guy got 15.2, so this guy's going to get 15.5. And he was always right. Like, I mean, John knew the game as well as yeah. anybody. I just thought it was insanity for these GMs to keep looking at and going, well, if everyone's paying this linebackers, herd, that, this that's herd what we mentality, pay linebackers. This herd mentality of the market. If linebackers are changing in value, why wouldn't you change with them? Well, it's always just going to be where precedent is, and teams are going to always use that. I guarantee if you why? gave truth serum, to, I get, if you gave truth serum to these teams, they would say, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm not, if, as long as I'm not losing the player, I'm not going to give in, even though I know his internal value to our team is more than just a little bit, a smidge higher than the other player at his position around the league. But if the if this is what the market is and I'm not going to have to pay him that, I'm not going to pay him that. But I still believe if you look at the top defenses in the league, um, they, they are really good at that position. What I'm saying is this, DJ. I look at the Seahawks just because I pulled them up, but we could look at other teams, yeah. and I'm sure there'd be some similarities. In the course of the last 15 minutes or so, you've told us how wide receivers are coming into the league at such an incredible rate that you're telling kids not to play it because there's yeah. just going to be so many people there. The Seahawks are paying Tyler Lockett a cap number of 19 million, DK Metcalf a cap number of 15 million, and they drafted Jackson Smith and Jigba in the first round. You're telling me that linebackers getting harder and harder to play, and it's harder and harder to find guys to play that position. Yet you're paying Jerome Baker six and a half million dollars on a one-year deal, and uh, Terrell Dodson four point two million cap number on a one-year deal. What am I missing? Like supply and demand should dictate that that doesn't make any sense. I think you're advocating for redis redistribution of wealth. In a I generally year, am. <laughs> and I think you should take calls on that and then just see how fired up. It won't be the first time lines. I've argued about redistribution of wealth with Brock, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, it's really good. Oh, this is just going terrifically. No, but I mean, like, look, you, here's a question for you. Um, the Chicago Bears, we would all agree, have one of the best defenses in the NFL right now, correct? Yes. Playing that way. And how about when Tremaine Edmonds is up and they got mocked. Do you remember? They got crushed for how much they paid him uh, in free agency coming over from the Buffalo Bills. And I know they have other great players on that defense, and, and uh, it's not just – he changed that defense, like from the middle linebacker position, completely changed it. You guys have a front-row seat to see San Francisco every year. For, for you know, what we said about Bosa and how great he is, Fred Warner is a freak show. Monster. Like, you you Monster. find a great defense. You guys saw it with the Seahawks mm -hmm. years, with the Legion of Boom, when all the attention was going to the secondary when you had the best linebacker core in the NFL. Um, so I, I still – I think you got to do your own evaluation on that thing, and I think you, you know, that is a very compelling point with where they're investing your money. That's the old line, right? You don't don't tell me what your priorities are. Show me your checkbook. Okay. Don't tell me where your All priorities right. so are. So you sent me a name earlier, and we got just a couple minutes here that was very intriguing yeah. to me. I mentioned the kid out of Cleveland, not going to happen. Three year, thirty nine million dollar yeah. deal this in August, so that's not going to happen. What about uh, what about DK for Devin Lloyd? What about yeah, a, you have to get some, you get something else in there? I think you'd get Devin Lloyd plus a pick. Um, and is he is he a difference have, maker? The linebacker I, down I from Utah at Jacksonville. The, yeah, I loved him coming out of college. And so I think it's one of those things where he could do so many different things that I you know I think it's taking him a minute to try and just settle in as just kind of a pure off the ball linebacker. Mm -hmm. um, but 
they have some depth. That's like if you look at the Jags roster, they have some guys at that position where maybe that's someone you could pry loose. He would upgrade. He would definitely upgrade uh, where the position is right now, and he's still young. So, I mean, that would be uh, that would be one worth exploring. Somebody sent us uh, DK for Penix. I think Atlanta says yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Okay, I don't, I don't either, think but... that one's going to happen. I don't think that <laughs> but they seem like happen. they've got a quarterback who's playing pretty darn well. What, what do you think happens there? Last thing for you, and, and just because the Seahawks are playing in Atlanta this weekend, how long yeah. does Kirk Cousins have that job, and how long can they sit Michael Penix? Well, if they can run the ball like they've been running it, he can turn around and hand it off. He's going to have some longevity, and you probably got to get you know two good years out of Kirk before you hand that thing off. So, um, I mean, I, I don't. Penix is going to be like thirty in two years. <laughs> I know, I know. That's why. Yeah, that, that's why with that whole thing. The, the uh, common sense take without the hot taking it was like you can't either either the signing of Cousins was a mistake or the drafting of Penix was a mistake. I, yes. I don't see how you can argue that any other way. One of those. Yeah. and Because everybody's like, oh, you're just – how can you say it if Penix hits? I'm like, well, if Penix hits – and he's out there early, then you shouldn't have paid Kirk Cousins what you paid him. You could have spread those resources. Like, you can't have it both ways. Oh, little Bob still. I know, yeah, out. you could join our afternoon show with that. That's, uh, that's Bob's favorite. <laughs> DJ, thank you. As always, really fun conversation. You didn't even get to talk about how Bo Nix was uh, when you got to see him up close oh, and personal this weekend. Did you, did you get a chuckle out of that text, how was he? by the way? How was he? Yeah. <laughs> It's a rough one. For three quarters, and then the fourth quarter. Sure. The fourth quarter. I think. I think Brock sent him a text. Yeah. And then uh, I just him gave up. him a wink from the press box, and yep. then he took off. Yeah. In the fourth quarter. Right. He can run, man. He can. He can definitely scoot. I like the way he moves. Yeah, the rest yeah. of the stuff. Yeah, he's, <sighs> the escapability is uh, is at the forefront. All there. right. Who's going to start in Pittsburgh this week? I, I mean, why would you? Why would you mention all that stuff if you weren't going to make that move? Like it's kind of an unsettling. You know, conversation that you just created if you're not going to go to Russell. So I mean, that's my expectation. Pretty crazy. All right, we got to run. You do as well. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, man. See you guys. There you go. There's Daniel Jeremiah from NFL Network. And of course, he joins us, Brock, every Wednesday at 8.30. We'll